You know, we live in a world where we often call that being the good Samaritan. And the truth is, that's like a glimpse of the good Samaritan. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Um, I uh, Some of you uh, know a good friend of ours here, Bo. And uh, Bo, why don't you come on up here? Bo's going to... Bo has asked if he could just give a prayer for our church and our congregation, and uh, uh, Bo is a Bo is just a dear man who uh, I met the first weeks that I came here. And uh, why don't you go ahead and come over here, Bo? Bo uh, Bo loves the Lord very very much, and uh, Bo actually met Pastor Fred down at the uh, YMCA many years ago playing volleyball, and uh, Bo just has a heart for the Lord, and he asked if he could just share before God the fact that he loves the Lord and he loves this church and he wants us to be people that are ministering people. Bo, go ahead and pray for us, okay? Awesome. First, I've got uh, two short messages for, <laughs> for our pastor in the past and in the present. We will be talking to you every Sunday to worship you, our God, of the universe to thank you for your kindness and your eternal love eternally the more I have had the enjoyment of speaking to our pastor the more I see the beauty in God's dealings with our church believe me it is working no matter what how many bumps you you you've come across don't ignore them but be be, be prepared keep him in your heart because he's got all the answers for us. Don't try to take it in your own hand. Pastor, Pastor had, had, had talked to us about that a few, a few sermons ago. And I believe in it. That's the way it works. The only way it works. God bless to be here with all of you right here. This is going to be my team forever. I Win or lose, this is my team. The gifts from pastor and experience are exactly what we need in this era of our church life here with Pastor uh, John and Pastor uh, Fred, what he did in the past. Keep that in one bundle. Keep that in your heart. I told John I'm a crybaby, but former athletes are all crybabies in general. We cry a lot. Uh, uh. My reactions, what I see in this super refreshing Sunday at the church, to be part of a team, our team, the people of, of God's team. And we will be like you, with the wisdom and the Holy Spirit that you provided for us forever. In the name of our law, Father, Jesus Christ, his son, self salvation, what he what he went through. God bless. We love you. Amen. Thank you, Bo. Oh. Now, let's just call the second hymn. Hallelujah. God bless all of you. Yeah. Bo's always an encouragement. He's uh, constantly asking about uh, making a difference in the world. And, you know, there's this phrase that got coined several years ago called uh, random acts of kindness. And random acts of kindness are, are wonderful things. But random, acts of, random acts of kindness are sometimes what you and I might call, um, it's life-changing. But you know who it's life-changing for typically? It's for us. The giver is the one whose life is beginning to change. Because life is not about them. They're learning to give. We're learning to give. We're learning to give in a fashion that simply says this. Life is about loving the way that we have been loved. In the book of Genesis, as, as God calls Abraham, he says, uh, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. 
You know, the story of the Good Samaritan is a story about 100% endless love. There's no limits of any kind whatsoever. There's not limits on culture. There's not limits on age. There's not limits on socioeconomics. There's not age on height or weight, on hair or not hair. There's absolutely no boundaries to simply loving with an endless love. Sometimes there's that idea of we, we contribute but in reality, there's that idea of I'm contributing, contributing, contributing to the point that I'm actually loving the person, not just simply relieving a guilt, not just simply making myself feel good, but I'm being an imitator of Jesus Christ. You know, there's great questions in life, and some of the great questions are those questions that aren't simple yes and no's. Have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody and all they keep doing is giving you those one word answers? And you're thinking, no, I'm like trying to engage here in conversation, okay? So here's some examples of of, of great questions, okay? You got PowerPoint working? If not, that's okay. Oh, it's up there. Oh, hey, have you ever asked somebody one of those Uh, Would you rather questions? Would you rather be at the beach or would you rather be at the at the ocean? Oh, I meant the mountains. Sorry. I made a mistake once before. It's the second time I did. Okay. Um, Tell me about a day you hope you'd never forget to live again. Okay. Um, Some of you have uh, been babysitters before for really young children and and. You asked them about 45 questions, and then you, and, and every one of them was, uh-huh, yes. Well, these are, these are the engaged. If your house were on fire, what are three items you would like to save? Now, that's, that, that's a question that causes a little bit of interaction, potentially. And, and this, this parable is, is really, it's, it's a response to a question. Let's take a look at this parable in, in Luke chapter 10. Incredible question. And it starts with a profound question. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This entire parable starts with a question about eternity. Not a question about the temporary. Not a question about trying to um, gain Uh, some minimal favor, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And if you notice this, he's got a major flaw here. And the flaw is, how can I earn eternal life? It didn't start with, how do I obtain? He's he's giving an action word. What do I do to gain eternal life? Verse 26, what is written in the law? He replied, hey, he's a lawyer. Why not talk about the law? He would know. Okay, And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. He's making reference to the fact that he understands the law of the Old Testament because this is first proclaimed in the Torah. Jesus said, and then he says, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he understands both of these things. Verse 28, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. And if you notice, he begins to focus on part of this. Verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. (gasps) A good lawyer, right? A good lawyer. A good lawyer. And who is my neighbor? He's deflecting the real issue here. He wants this to be about actions. He does not want it to be about his heart. We had a discussion a couple of weeks ago in staff meeting, and uh, we're going through this little uh, b- book. And one of the questions asked about how do you, how do you, um, how do you really love somebody? And I love Tom Bet George's response. He says, "Well, you start actually loving them." He says, "Everybody can see through fake love. All it is is a bunch of series of actions 
He says, when you start loving is when you start loving. Speech means nothing. So, so, so Jesus is going to the heart here. He's staying away from the action. But the gentleman, the lawyer, he was trying to go for the action when he says, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, and this is the parable. And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after them, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So here's the basics of this. The basics are this. A man had a question. It happened to be a lawyer. He uses this guy's knowledge to build a bridge. Have you ever built bridges through conversations? Like, like you're, you're just trying to engage conversation. The, the, the content is not important. It's just beginning the relationship. The, the, lawyer, the lawyer knew the law. He speaks of the most important. Notice he doesn't speak to the Ten Commandments. He speaks to the summary. And he speaks about loving with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, about cherishing God far and above anything else that exists in the world. With every single fiber we have, loving the Lord, holding nothing back. This is sincerity. Do you know what sincerity of love is? Sincerity of love is one that has no wax. I shared this recently. Back in the day, they used to have sincere statues, and they had insincere statues. The sincere statue was the one that was carved, and there was no mistake. But as you're taking away the chips that you don't want when you're making a statue, you might accidentally take off where the guy's nose was supposed to be. And in the midst of the nose, you find some wax that's the same color. And you do your best to formulate that. But in the sun, you can see a little bit of a reflection. Or in the deepness of the heat of the sun, if it wasn't in the shade, it might start to melt. And that would be an insincere statue. An insincere statue is not worth anywhere near as much as a sincere statue. And you and I are told to love with sincere love. Holding absolutely nothing back from the Father. This speaks of a journey. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, Jerusalem was about 2,900 feet above sea level or 3,000 feet above sea level. And, and, and Jericho is about eight to 900 feet, maybe even 1,000 feet below sea level. So he's going down. He's going down this 4,000-foot elevation change. It's about a 17-mile trek. Okay, it's curvy. There's huge drop-offs. There's caves and rocks to hide behind. It would not be a safe place to be. Records show that in the 4th century, this was an Arab highway where men were known to rob and kill people even still. The actual pass is called the Adamum. It's also known as what's called the Bloody Pass because of the number of murders that took place on this road. It is a place of real sin. It's a place of real pain. The dangers in life on this are absolutely real. Does it sound like some of the cities of America? And in this pain, this is what took place. There was a stripping of this man to complete nakedness. It says he stripped the man. There was a, there was a complete robbing of everything that he owned as he, as he robbed him and he took all of his possessions. He beat him repeatedly. That's the way the word, when it says beat, the way the word is, it's just 
continuing. He left him barely alive. He left him completely hopeless. And then there is what we call a helpless hope arrives. What's a helpless hope? Somebody who dresses the part but has no action. A priest. (gasps) A priest. Of all the people who ought to help, how many of you are thinking, that's right. That's what he's... paid to do and the listener the lawyer's thinking oh, he he's like this is going to be taken care of right here this guy's going to be a hero he's the priest he's a servant of god he's one whose acts of service are designed to bring people to the lord and the priest would be familiar with the truths of scripture leviticus 19 it says when you see a stranger in need do whatever it takes to help him In Exodus 22, it says, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his fallen ox by the way and ignore them. Deuteronomy 15 says, for there you will never cease to help the poor in the land. I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother and to the needy and to the poor in your land. In Micah 6, 8, it says, he has told you, he has told you, O man, what is good And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly before the Lord? He knows these things. This is hope, but it's helpless hope because he does not engage. Jesus is changing the focus of this man's question from what do you do to where is your heart? Because the law actually states the importance of the heart. Who is my neighbor? This priest didn't love. This priest didn't care. He's thinking this is outside of my job description. It's not my job. I'm a contractual worker. The priest, sadly, is of the same nationality as the one who was wounded. He doesn't even have to cross the cultural barrier. Then we have the Levite, or should we say, likewise, the Levite. So the priest is like, he's like what you would call your uh, first class religious help guy. And then the second class would be the Levite. He's, he's, he's from the tribe of Levi. He, he's, he's got a lot of priestly qualities, but he's just the assistant. He's like your second class guy. Okay? Okay. So there's still an element of hope here. He's one who's familiar with all the priestly duties. He's familiar with the law. He's an assistant. He's not the priest, but he's close enough to be without any excuse whatsoever. Same routine. He goes on the other side. Have you ever been walking down the street? I'm afraid of dogs, if you don't know that, okay? I got bit by a German shepherd in the rear end. I got bit by a bulldog and almost lost my calf. So when I see a dog, it's like this. Okay, I'm not proud of this, but I would put my stroller when our kids were young in between me and a dog, okay? I'm just being perfectly honest, okay? Um, And I would hide behind Bev, no joke, okay? Because dogs scare me. If you've ever been bit by a bulldog and had a hold of your whole calf, you would understand, okay? And if your rear end was bleeding because of a German shepherd, you might have some comprehension of what I'm talking. Ever happened to any of you guys before? Okay, a few, a, few, a few of you have had that privilege, right? These guys didn't, the, these, these two guys didn't love God, okay? They are failures of loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. They're failures at loving others like themselves. How many of you are good at splurging on yourself? How many of you are like, I got a credit card, of course. How many of you are familiar with McDonald's Supersize? You splurged a little bit, okay? How many of you are familiar with, hey, for $2 extra? How many of you are familiar with, well, it's on sale. Spend more, save more. How many of you are like, L'Oreal, I'm worth it? (laughs) Men, don't raise your hand. 
think for a moment. There was a failure to love ourselves. And what's happening here is we're gaining a picture. We're gaining a picture that some of those things that we try to do sometimes, we try to earn God's favor. You know, church attendance, tithing, saying prayers, reading the scriptures, having your grandmother be the church organist, having your name on a church roll, going through the motions does nothing. Real love is what's needed. You see, because real love starts in the heart. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3, give a great summary of this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Imagine doing one of the greatest deeds in the world and Jesus in heaven being, I'm not even putting that in the ledger. Because that was for your benefit. That was to look good to somebody else. But then there's the yes, there's the Samaritan. But a certain Samaritan was on a journey. Not necessarily a place that you might find a Samaritan ordinarily on this road. Why? Because they know their place. They know their spot in society. And it's not where other people are. He's not the one likely to help. The, the, the lawyers listen to this going, I'm not even going to listen at this point. This isn't even worth listening to. You're talking about, you started out with the first team, then you went to the coach. Now you're going to the baggage claim section? This guy's not on good term with the Jews. He's hated by the Jews. He's despised by the Jews. He's avoided by the Jews. You know, the Samaritans were actually the people who Sanballat led in a prevention of the walls of Jericho being rebuilt. Jerusalem. Thank you for that correction. That was my first mistake since the other one I made earlier. Here's two guys that have no love who you would expect to have love. And here's one guy who you would expect not to have love who does have love. Do you remember going through the book of James and the key theme is we need to be doers of the word. So the question is this, what in the world is real love? And if you look in verses 33 and 34, we gain this great insight into what real love is all about. Verse 33 says this, he saw him and he had compassion. He didn't see him and think, he's different than me. He didn't see him and say, do I want to help him? He didn't see him and say, not this time. He does something with his sight. He acts upon what is known, and that is that there's someone hurt. Verse 34 a, a direct reference point would be this. He went in his direction, whereas the two other men went around. They went in the opposite direction. The direct phrase would be that he went in that direction. He executes his condition. He assesses his trauma and he acts. Jesus doesn't put in all the details here, but we do know this. The man was beaten, he was naked, and he was penniless. In verse 34, we understand this. He uses his own resources, not somebody else's resources. He uses his own hands. He uses his own head. He uses his own arm. He uses his own pocketbook to make a difference. The man was naked, and it was his cloth, the cloth of a Samaritan that would have given him something. He was stripped completely. The wine would have been an antiseptic. The oil would have been something to begin to heal and help heal. His donkey would have been a ride. His money at the inn. I read something that says that a night's stay would be approximately one thirty-second of a denarii to one twelfth of a denarii. He actually paid for somewhere between 24 and 68 nights to be able to stay there. 
That's we're talking a month's rent. But he doesn't stop there. He says, "I'll be back to take care of this." Now, here's the here's the interesting part. It was probably a Jewish hotel. And a Samaritan is saying, I'll be back to pay for it. The fact that you're here to begin with is amazing. The generosity of the Samaritan is endless. It's not about his convenience. There's no limits to his love. He crosses every boundary. That's generosity. Here's that aha moment, and that's this. That's what it means to love our neighbor. You ever put extra cheese on? Ladies, have you ever wanted that manicure? Why they call it a manicure when it's a woman, I don't understand, okay? But that's beyond the point. You ever, you ever, you ever splurge and buy better tickets to the game? I'm not going for the end zone. I'm going for the 40-yard line this time. This is about being neighborly. We're basically being asked to be imitators of Christ. What's an imitator of Christ look like? Is it a long sleeve shirt? Is it a polo? Is it a button up with a real fancy tie? This is my favorite tie in the whole world right there. Make sure you get that on video, okay? I wore that the first day of teaching every year. Is it wearing a t-shirt? Is it wearing a Hawaiian shirt? Is it wearing a sport coat? Is it wearing a beat up shirt that's kind of worn? Is it wearing a hoodie? When it comes to loving people, does it matter what we look like? No. When it comes to loving people, does it matter what they're like? It shouldn't. We just simply need to take to heart this idea of love your neighbor extensively. And as Jesus said, as we love the little ones, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be a neighbor. And let's be the kind of neighbor that Jesus was. I'm going to pray. We're going to be heading outside for some singing in a little bit. If you're online... I want you to know we got a little transition video as we're uh, making our way outside. If you need some lyrics, there's some there, okay, um, on a little stand, and there's some on other stands. You can go all the way around the corner over there. Um, we got, uh, we got, try to take advantage of as much shade as possible. We just want to respond to God's love for us through song. What a great opportunity to praise the Lord in those regards, okay? Let me pray for us before we head outside. Father God, I ask that our singing today, that our worship and song would be an expression of deep within us what is happening in regards to love. I pray that it would be an expression of our intention, an expression of our practices, an expression of who it is that we want to be. Sometimes we are still learning about loving in these regards, but we pray that we would be and we would be actors of a full